Good day, and uh, I should say thank you for the time that you have given me to come into your places and spaces to bring what I believe would be a blessed uh, message from God to to you and to me today, and I want to welcome you to September the 25th, 2022, here in central Alberta and area, and wherever else you may be. Uh, listening or watching, um, or both, from this particular uh, in the world, We've got a mouthful of marbles there. And uh, so, why don't we just begin? Now, the date is September eighth, twenty twenty-two. Just recently, the place was Balmoral Castle, Aberdeenshire, Scotland, where Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and her realms and territories, Queen head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith, died at the age of 96 after reigning for 70 years. Approximately three more, three decades, but closer to four decades ago, a young man, green behind the ears, with his one hand placed on the Bible, on a Bible, the other raised, said the following words. I... Antonio Raymond Pasoli, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors according to the law. So help me God. You know, as I've been pondering all the events of the past few weeks, the outpouring of support and words of affection for the Queen, the pomp and circumstance of all of that event, the world watching, the passing of a queen and the appointment of a king. Uh, I was thinking about my commitment that I made so many years ago to queen and country, pondering my commitment to duty. As I promised, so help me God, I was reminded of what the queen, in her own way, in her own way often pointed to in over the past 70 years of her reign and in her life, that God has been the mainstay of my life and service. It's interesting and so true how we can take so many things for granted. We all do that. We do this with our parents, our spouses, our children, our family, friends, and and, and many other ways we take things for granted. And it's at a time uh, like the death of a person who had a significant role or presence in our lives that in many ways we are Uh, forced, in a way, to slow down and consider our own lives, or at least challenged to do that, to consider our relationships with our family, friends, our workmates, and all those, and even our relationship with God. I think that the Queen often thought about these things over her life of service. So I just want to share a few uh, quotes from Queen Elizabeth II, uh, what I'm calling Faith Quotes. So on the very first Christmas broadcast as Queen, just before her coronation, she asked the people of the UK to pray for her for her royal position. She said this, quote, I want to ask you all to pray for me on that day, to pray God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. And then a number of years later, 1981 to be exact, on her Christmas broadcast, she said this, quote, Christ not only revealed to us the truth in his teachings, he lived by what he believed and gave us the strength to try to do the same things. And finally on the cross, he showed the supreme example of physical and moral courage. That sacrifice was the dawn of, that sacrifice was the dawn of Christianity and this is why at Christmas time we are inspired by the example of Christ as we celebrate his birth. And then in 2011, during the Christmas broadcast, Queen Elizabeth said this, quote, it is my prayer that on this Christmas day we might find room in our lives for the message of the angels and for the love of God through Christ our Lord. And then on her final Christmas message, she said this, Jesus, a man whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation, and have been the bedrock of my faith. His birth marked a new beginning. So please now turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be uh, looking at the first 19 verses 
there. And let's read those together right now. So first, uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Now, would, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he was raised, whom we did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are, we are of all people more to be pitied. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for this scripture that we're about to unpack somewhat. Today we ask that by your Holy Spirit you illuminate this text to us. Help us to understand uh, the implications of this in, in our lives, but also in, in the greater gospel that we're talking about today. And God, in all these things, may you be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So all my pondering and considering and thinking over the last days of the Queen's death, and more importantly, the witness to her trust in Jesus Christ, it really brought me to 1 Corinthians 15. And really, it's been a sort of a gentle burden on my mind and heart to press pause for today in our series in the book of Daniel, and that's what we're going to do. Hence the reason we read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to, 1 to 19. Now, as we turn our attention to chapter 15 uh, in Paul's Corinthian letter, we are reminded that the Apostle Paul was addressing a church that he had planted during his second missionary journey. And as far as we can conclude, Paul had spent about 18 months in Corinth building up the body of Christ before moving on to other destinations. Now some time has gone by, and Paul writes this letter to deal with a number of serious problems that had found their root in the church. And time being not our friend here, we're going to have to leave it at that for now. But overall, the Corinthian church, the big picture, it was a biblical church. And we can see here in our text that Paul was writing to believers, followers of Christ, people who had accepted the gospel, people who had received it in which they would make their stand. We see that in verse 1. So our focus today will be, as one commentator put it, the pure, unadulterated gospel. And it's vital to this pure, unadulterated, unadulterated gospel that is the, is the fact of the resurrection of Christ. That is, that Jesus Christ was, according to Paul, raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And from the resurrection of Jesus Christ flows the rest of the gospel implications, which includes, dear friends, the resurrection of the dead to come on Judgment Day. One cannot overstress the importance of this key element of the gospel, which it is indeed a key element, essential element, better said. Pastor John MacArthur provides commentary uh, regarding the resurrection when he said, quote, the truth 
of the resurrection gives life to every other area of gospel truth. The resurrection is a pivot on which all of Christianity turns, and without which none of the truths would much matter. Without the resurrection, Christianity would be so much wishful thinking, taking its place alongside all other human philosophy and religious speculation, end quote. So today we have a question before us that we must face head on and answer. What does a resurrection mean to you? What does it mean to you? Well, let's begin by unpacking the Apostle Paul's doctrine of the resurrection as provided for us here in chapter 15. We have already clarified that Paul was writing to brothers and sisters in Christ that the word that Paul had preached had been received. We saw that in verse 1 and 2. And now, here in verse 3 to 4, Paul prefaces that he had delivered as of first importance what he had received. Paul didn't receive something that he invented, something he bought at a store, or a book he read. He had received this message of the gospel. And Paul's emphasis on on the gospel he had received and preached is really important for us in the 21st century church, especially here in the West. And here's why. Paul was not a lone ranger apostle. He didn't run around preaching some other kind of gospel. He preached the gospel he had received directly from Jesus Christ himself. And he preached the same gospel that the other apostles had received directly from Jesus Christ. Friends, this is what makes the apostles the apostles. They were the ones that Jesus Christ himself directly passed on the gospel to. This is a crucial point because in our day, there are many, there are a number who are standing up and proclaiming themselves as apostles, as Paul was an apostle, as John was an apostle, as as an apostle as in the New Testament era. But the Bible is unmistakable here. These self-proclaimed apostles of our day are really frauds, fakes, and charlatans. But of course, I seem to be digressing here. Go back to verse 3 and 4. Here contains the essential components of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you permit me this analogy, I hope it works for the majority of us. When we consider the natural world around us, creation, and we can bring that all down to the atom. The atom. And within the atom, we find the core or the essential components. We find the nucleus, which is made up of protons, which are positively charged. The nucleus is also made of neutrons, which have no charge. And surrounding the nucleus, often described as a cloud of is a cloud of electrons, and these have a negative charge. So here's the analogy. Verse 3 and 4 contains the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons that make up the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul gives us here, in verse 3 and 4, the essentials. One, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Two, he was buried. Three, he was raised on the third day in accordance, pardon me, with the scriptures. So let's take each of these elements of the gospel one at a time, beginning here in verse 3, with Christ died for our sins. We go to Matthew's gospel at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. We see uh, John the Baptist has been in, you know, doing the work that God had called him to do. And one day Jesus was coming to, uh, was going to see John the Baptist. John the Baptist looked up, saw Jesus coming and said this, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins, the sin of the world. You find that in John chapter 1, verse 29. We know that John the Baptist was a prophet sent by God. And by saying this very statement, this prophet of God gives us a rich treasure chest, if you will, of biblical truth. Friends, this statement is loaded to bear. For example, one, we see the spiritual condition of the world and the people therein. Paul would put it this way in his Roman letter uh, in chapter 3, 23, uh, 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
A couple of verses earlier in the same letter, chapter 3, Paul would say this, None is righteous. No, no one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. And he sort of puts it all together by saying, There is no fear of God in their eyes. Friends, essentially all are born spiritually blind to their very own deadly sin condition. Paul writes a letter to a fellow believer and servant, Titus, and he said this in that letter, chapter 3, verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish and disobedient, led astray, that is, deceived, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. So friends, one, we are all born sinners. Two, every single sin committed from the moment Adam and Eve sinned, all sin will come under the judgment and wrath of a sovereign and holy and just God on the day of judgment. We turn to the prophet Isaiah, who spoke to a nation, the nation of Israel, the people of God, uh, to encourage them, no, to proclaim them to repent and turn back to God. In chapter 24 to 26, it speaks there in those chapters to the great and fearsome day of the judgment to come, that God will judge the whole earth, that not a stone will be left unturned. Every stone will be overturned on that day. A holy and just God will bring his judgment upon the world. We see this where Isaiah said this in Isaiah 26, 21. Isaiah said, The Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. This is not a very popular message today from many of the pulpits uh, of, uh, <laughs> of the evangelical churches. So one, we are all born sinners. Two, every sin, all sin, will come under the judgment and wrath of a holy and just God. You see, John the Baptist here in one statement gave us so much more. But he gives us more to consider. He gives us something called hope. Yes, we are all sinners under the judgment of God. But John points us to the rescuer, the one that will rescue people from their sins sent by God. Behold the Lamb of God, he says here. This is the spotless Lamb of God who died for your sin and my sin, for the sin of the world. Isaiah would go on to say this in Isaiah 53, 5. He, that is Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The Apostle Peter put it this way in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 24. Peter said, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. You know, friends, when Paul said that Christ died for our sins, he meant exactly that. Each and every sin you and I have done or ever will do, will do received the judgment and wrath of God in full upon the crucified Savior on the tree. It is paid in full, dear friends. So one, Christ died for our sins. Two, he was buried. After Christ died, he was taken down from the cross and he was buried. He was put in a tomb. So we find here in Matthew's Gospel a number of accounts we see this in Matthew's Gospel and the other Gospels where ruling religious leaders would often challenge Jesus. And one time they challenged Jesus by asking him for a sign. I suppose to prove himself, to trap them, uh, to prove himself, pardon me, or to trap them, trap Jesus. And Jesus responded by saying this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 and 40. Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Again, we, we go back to Matthew later on in the gospel. Jesus, we find, was preparing his disciples for his death and resurrection. And he said to his disciples this in Matthew 16, 21. Jesus said that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And we see that after Jesus 
died on the cross. Matthew tells us that a rich man from Arimathea, a follower of Jesus, asked and received permission from Pilate to take the body down, the dead body of Jesus down, and put him into a sealed tomb. So one, Christ died for our sins. Two, he was buried. Three, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We go to John's Gospel, chapter 2, and we see that after Jesus had turned wine, water into wine, at the wedding in Cana, he went to Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover. And upon entering the temple there, the chapter 2 of John tells us that he saw the sellers of animals and the money exchangers, and he made what John describes a whip of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple. Then he was asked by the Jews after this was done, what sign do you show us for doing these things that you are doing? I put that in myself. Uh, what signs do you show for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy the temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Of course, the Jews were probably astounded and they did reply this way, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? Of course, we know we have the benefit of the gospel before us that Jesus was not talking about the building. And John tells us that his disciples would also remember what he was talking about. What was he talking about? He was talking and he was speaking, according to John, about the temple of his body. And that's what he was doing. But last but not least, the Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, was filled by the Holy Spirit. And he said to the crowds that were around him, the very first sermon in the New Testament era, men of Israel, hear these words. Not New Testament, the church era, pardon me. Man of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, that this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised them up, loosening, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then we go to verse 5 to 9, where we see where Jesus would show himself. He went to Peter, says Cephas, Peter, to the, the disciples, and he went on into the 500. And Peter also said here in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, this Jesus, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we were all witnesses. So they were all witnesses to the resurrection. So one, Christ died for our sins. Two, he was buried. Three, he was raised on the third day. Here we have the pure, unadulterated gospel. Here we have the essential, essential elements of the gospel. Well, let's go back and let's try, and let's, and let's ask that question again that we were challenged with. What does the resurrection mean to you? Now, do you have an answer? It's important. If someone said to you, it's impossible. It is impossible to come back from the dead. What would you say to that person? I was looking at the, considering the Jehovah Witnesses. I don't know how they popped in, but they came into my mind as I was preparing. And I, saw, and I did some research and found out there's about 8.7 million members worldwide. And if you were to ask them if they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they would answer yes. But did you know that they don't believe that Jesus was raised with a physical body? They teach that Jesus was raised in a spiritual body only. You see, the core essentials are necessary. Jesus was raised with a physical resurrection. So from verse 1 to 11, Paul gave us the essential components of the gospel, that the resurrection of our Lord was a physical resurrection. And friends, that is Paul's point. This is the point he was trying to make to the Corinthian church. And this is critically important because it seems here in Paul's church, and the, not Paul's church, but the Corinthian church, as there are today, there are some that were saying there's no resurrection of the dead, period. So we have to ask our question, how did Paul deal with this? Well, we find that from t verse 12 to 19. He presented his case, what, was, what is called from the lesser to the greater and he asked the question, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then he makes this statement, pardon me, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Okay, Paul, so Christ wasn't raised. What then? He goes on to say, if Christ was not raised, then our preaching was in vain, 
and your faith is in vain. Friends, he's saying that our preaching today, if Christ was not raised from the dead, is in vain, it's empty, it's futile. And that our faith as followers of Christ is empty, it's futile. It is useless. Okay, Paul, what next? Well, if Jesus was not raised, then we were false witnesses, he said. We misrepresented him because we said he was raised from the dead. In other words, we lied. We told you a lie. It gets worse. Paul repeats himself, if Christ has not been raised, verse 17, your faith, my faith, is empty, futile, worthless. And therefore we remain lost in our sins. And we will face the judgment of a holy and righteous God. And then he goes on to say, it gets even worse. All who have died believing in Christ have perished, have been destroyed. They're done in. Can it get any worse? Yes. And this is the greater. If, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, or as another version says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, well, then we are a pitiful lot, aren't we? So we're back with our question. What does the resurrection mean to you? I think I have a hunch here regarding the Queen Elizabeth, regarding Queen Elizabeth and how she would have answered the question given that one-on-one -on -one possibility there between you and her or me and her. I think she would say this, in her own words, Christ died for my sins. He was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I think she would have said that. So I leave you with these words from Jesus to Martha, grieving the death of her brother Lazarus. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And the question he asked Martha, I ask of you, do you believe this? Oh, Lord God, God our Father, we thank you so much for the gospel message. It is not complicated. It is not something to be debated. It is simple. Christ has died for us, for our sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. This is the pure, unadulterated gospel. We thank you for that message of hope in a world that is dark and without hope in many ways. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are listening to this, God, that you would bless them from the top of their heads to the bottoms of their feet. And those who are listening that are not sure about Jesus, that they would hear the sure call of God for the hope that, he, the hope that we can have in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great, blessed day. Shalom.